Um, this is the, the last week of this, this session here. Uh, as you can tell, we've gone through quite a few things from how to make, uh, find out if a candidate endorses your issues to whether or not they're politically viable, how to figure out a budget, uh, some tactics to use uh, to get involved in electoral politics. Uh, and now we're gonna learn about polling. Uh, not only my favorite subject, but I think one of the most influential things that go into running an election. Uh, also be, could be one of the most costly ones. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but uh, because we've had so many participants and so many signups for this, and a lot of good notes about uh, other issues we should talk about, uh, I want Jonathan to let us know about what's coming next and uh, what it's gonna look like. Absolutely, yes. I'm excited to hear how Kirsten incorporates polling into every aspect of his life, uh, since he's such a big fan of it. But um, we'll do polls on uh, what to feed you, what to feed your child for dinner tonight. We'll go, all kinds of interactive polls coming up on this on this session. Just kidding. But um, anyway, we talked about where to go next with this, and we're gonna we're gonna keep producing content. We think folks wanna wanna know about uh, political engagement, and so uh, we're gonna go to a biweekly format. Um, and uh, there are so there you have on your screen um, those those things we're going to do fundraising and good voter contact um, in July we have uh, COVID and politics and uh, sort of the elected official perspective on working with third party organizations in August bipartisanship and coalition building in September and then what do you do after an election how do you follow up election win or loss? And also, um, oh, I, typo, I'm sorry, but uh, the last thing was candidate recruitment. So how do we move forward? How do you find candidates for future elections? So that's, uh, that's where we're headed. I'm excited. I think there are topics that a lot of people are interested in. Yeah, and as always, if there's anything else, you know, of these topics that you'd like us to go a little deeper on or recommendations or questions you have that, that you'd like some thought partnership, please feel free to send it on over to us. This is how we decided on these issues here. Uh, and so today's, today, uh, we're gonna just jump right into it. There's so much to cover around polling. It, it's, I honestly think that we're gonna cover four main buckets. Uh, I think each of these buckets could take an hour themselves. So we're gonna condense a lot of information to a, a tight window here to be respectful of your time. Um, but there is a lot to learn here uh, and a lot to have a conversation around about how to become stronger at polling, how to get yourself uh, more become more of an expert and how to ensure that your polling is is always at the top level and so uh, you know we're going to get into the headlines and also get into the to the training and then also have room for Q&A so we'll get right into the headlines now yeah so my first thing is something that um, I'm not necessarily speaking to this one topic but uh, you know uh, I think it's just using it as a more general discussion about campaign contributions. So groups that people that are on this call theoretically are raising money from organizations and individuals to fund their political work. And uh, is related to some of the uh, racial uh, justice discussions. Uh, some uh, left-leaning politicians are returning donations from police unions. And you know that's certainly their right. It's not something I probably would do if I was in their shoes. But I understand that in the end, you know, I I don't begrudge anyone that uh, to take the money from where they want to take it. Uh, and that's actually one reason why I'm a big proponent for transparency in campaign finance reform because then uh, people can know exactly where you get your money and make their judgments about whether they trust your voice about an issue. What I wanted to link it to, though for a lot of these organizations that might be listening to this uh, webinar is I, I do think a lot of times activists overreact to um, criticisms of where they get their money. Now, in a case like this, you know, they're making a, a moral stand, whether you agree or disagree with it about where they take their money. But in cases where you're just worried more about the political side of it, um, absolutely should think about that. But I would tell you, most people overreact to that. And uh, you know, when you're thinking about who your donors are, there, there might be some criticism, but you know, is it criticism you wouldn't have gotten anyway? Uh, which is what I tell most people. So my, my point is, if, if you have an important moral stand you wanna take, by all means, do what you need to do. But uh, if, if you stand with your supporters and, and you personally have no concerns with them, uh, you probably aren't gonna, it's probably not gonna be as big a problem as you think. 
Yeah, I, uh, when I first got into politics, I always thought this was a, a big deal, that the public would be outraged if they found out you got money from X organization. Um, and the more time I spend in this and the more, you know, disclosure laws become ever evolving, uh, I'm realizing that people who would, are going to vote against you because of you got money from X organization they don't agree with, they were never with you in the first place. Um, and so and in such a small percentage of people who really pay attention to where like the money's coming from, um, and even those who don't pay attention but are, then are made aware of it, it's not the deciding point. Like that, that's not the tipping point that, that they make their decision on. It's much more on the messaging that they receive about the candidates. Uh, so yeah, I can, I can go into great length about uh, the police, the police union and the sheriff's union here, here in uh, California, because it's a... Uh, yeah, and that's right. I mean, there are, again, this is, this is not a perfect example because they're not taking a stand for political reasons so much, but it just reminded me of, uh, it just reminded me of those things that come up a lot when we deal with uh, third party politics and engaging, or even for candidates, you know, who are often called on to return donations. Um, yeah. And sometimes yeah. there's a reason and you should, you should think about it. I just would be a little more skeptical. I would err more towards skepticism about rejecting a gift than as, as opposed to uh, uh, leaning that way. Yeah, and the other fact that I, I think people forget is that sometimes contribution limits are so low it doesn't really make a difference. So, you know, why, why take the PR hit or why, you know, make, make yourself a center of conversation when you don't have to, uh, when, you know, a $1,500 check isn't gonna make or break your election that costs, you know, a million dollars to run. That's a good point too. Yeah, weighing the weighing the pros and cons of it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my what's interesting this week is it's very convoluted. So so bear with me. So I saw a blog about how Joe Biden's campaign in winning uh, the the primary proves that polling doesn't work and proves that organizing uh, communities doesn't work. Um, and and the the evidence that they point to is that. Uh, Joe Biden on Super Tuesday won states where he had no organizers on the ground or maybe one at the very most, for example, in Pennsylvania. And they said that in the polls there that he was in third place, fourth place, but he won by double digits. Uh, and so I found that really interesting. It was, a, it was kind of a thought piece that I thought was interesting, but here what I'm sharing is polling. Uh, kind of duck tells nicely what we're doing here. And the poll that I'm sharing here is these polls were all done before Iowa caucus. And what you'll see here is at the very top, the number one thing that people care about uh, Democrats polled is the ability to beat Donald Trump. That's like far and away the number one thing that people care about. The second thing you'll see at the very bottom is that a generic Democrat, the Democrats would vote for a generic Democrat over, over a generic Republican, 48 to 40%. So what this tells me is that we shouldn't have been surprised by Joe Biden's rise, because if you think of, of his campaign, since day one, he's been saying, I will beat Donald Trump like a drum. Like that was his message from day one. He never skewed from it. He was attacked from you know, all sides about multiple policy issues, but he continuously went back to, look at the polling, I'm beating him in Texas, I'm beating him in Florida, I'm beating him in Pennsylvania. Um, and then also when you think of the spectrum of Democrats, um, you know, you have your more moderate, more conservative Democrats, you have your more liberal Democrats. And Joe Biden really does fall dead in the middle of that. And so all this to say is like for months and months and months leading up to Super Tuesday, where Joe Biden really ran away with it, Democrats across the country have been telling us that they want, what the, the main thing they care about is someone who could beat Donald Trump and they want a generic safe Democrat. And to me, that is the embodiment of Joe Biden. Um, and, you know, the reason I bring this up is that uh, we should really listen to polling. <laughs> polling tells us where to go. Uh, I, Jonathan, I, I'm going to steal this like forever now. It's like polling, you shouldn't use polling to change people's mind. You should use polling to figure out where people are at and, and essentially be a mirror and reflect back what they've been telling you. And they've been telling us for a while that they wanted a Joe Biden kind of politics in, in their primary. Hmm. So you're saying is, as opposed to saying polling was wrong, if you really dug deeper into the polls and, and read a poll critically, the answers were there is what you're saying. So Absolutely. maybe some of, that, 
some of those early like 10% for Warren, 7% for Buttigieg. Um, those were like kind of their heart speaking. But if you really dug into the information, you know, the answer was there for, um, for Biden. Yeah. And I think the other thing to note that we'll get into a little later on is you'll also see there's so many undecideds, right? So when it's a generic ballot, they'll give you an answer. But when you ask them specifically, what candidate do you care about? The undecideds are through the roof. I don't think we've ever seen that many undecideds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a key. Like I think one, especially for a lot of us who are on this call is we're going to get involved in races that are state led races that are municipal races um, where your candidate and your opponents don't have a high name ID. And you're, especially that first early on poll, the benchmark poll that you do in the, in the early summer, you're going to see 70%, 50% undecided. And I think we need to be critical and know how to, how to use that data moving forward. Gotcha. So we'll jump into the polling basics. So I'm going to go rapid fire through this. Um, again, any questions you have, type them into the chat, type them into the Q&A. Uh, but I want to make sure we have enough time to really dig into some of the polling examples we have here. So I'll jump right into it. So the first things about what, why, about polling basics is you got to ask yourself, why should you conduct a poll? And I would say there's three main reasons you should conduct one. The first one is to learn about public sentiment or the knowledge on something. Uh, the second one would be Gardner guidance on messaging. And the third is understanding the candidate's position in the electoral race. And so I'll dig a little deeper into the learn about public sentiment. What, what this really means is you're gonna get a snapshot and that's exactly what it is. It's a snapshot of that exact moment of what the public thinks and feels. Now, typically, especially on these lower ballot races, you won't see that public sentiment really radically change unless something big happens. And so a perfect example of something quote unquote big happening is what we're living through right now. We've seen a huge public sentiment change around, uh, around issues of racism, around issues of policing, uh, legislation and things of that nature. So this is something that is ca catastrophically changes your polling. So for example, if I ran a poll five weeks ago, I would say that in all likelihood, um, I would have to re-poll because public sentiment has likely changed, especially if any of the things I polled on were about, do we think the government's doing a good job? Do we think elected officials are listening to the people? Anything of that sense. I think prior to that, and this is why I feel bad for pollsters right now, we had COVID. Right? I don't think anyone had lived through COVID. And we're at different stages around the country, a different COVID. Some people are still at stay at home. Some people have fully opened. Some people have you know, rates going up, some of this going down. So these are all big public sentiment changes. In a year of not 2020, you wouldn't see these kind of big changes. You typically would see that people are just have an opinion on where direction the country is going, the state, the city, so on and so forth. Um, and so you'd only conduct a poll to learn that public sentiment. The second thing is guidance on messaging. Um, this is the tricky part, and we'll get into this a little bit later on how to write a poll, but you'll get guidance on messaging. And what you won't get is a silver bullet, right? You're, the, the feedback that you'll get on your poll is only as good as the options you give them. So for example, if you give four messaging options to the voting public, then this, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the best one. You're going to get the best of the four you've provided them. Um, and so this is kind of tricky and why you need to ensure that you're picking a, a really smart, intelligent pollster. And then the third one is to understand a candidate's position. You know, this, you, you do a poll to figure out someone's name ID, um, whether their bio resonates with the public, whether their messaging resonates with the public. These are the reasons you would conduct the poll. Um, a lot of people think about polling, um, and, and they try to do too much with one or the other. Um, and, and that's something that I, I want to make sure we, we understand here. So uh, what a poll will and won't do. So I gave you a little bit about this. What it will do is give you a snapshot of public sentiment. What it will do is provide a possible pathway to victory. Again, it won't give you the silver bullet. It'll give you options that best resonate with voters. Um, and it will give you leverage. And so this is one thing that I've noted in other, other webinars. Polling really does give you leverage because you essentially hold the keys, especially if you're one of the early, early on organizations that do polling, it gives you a key to a number of information from how they can win, the likelihood of them winning, and what could really put them over the top. And that's incredibly valuable when you're going into a coalition or thinking about um, how to position your organizations to get involved in the race. Um, things a poll won't do, again, I, I said this at the end, it's not gonna give you a silver bullet, but it also doesn't account for possible changes in the race. Um, so remember, this is a snapshot, and typically when you do the snapshot on polling, 
uh, you're not getting oppositional negative mail hit the public or negative messaging on TV or radio. And so you can account for these changes that are going to happen in the race. Um, and also obviously can account for COVID or uh, anything of that nature. So um, it's really important to know, you know, there's going to be times where you run an election and you lose. Uh, you're going to have to explain why didn't you see X coming? Well, you know, you got to be able to make sure you're accounting for as much as possible in your polling, but also know that there's going to be changes that are out of your control. And uh, it's really up to you to ad adapt in that situation, but not really, um, you know, you can't really blame the polling for being wrong on, on certain situations. Yeah, I, I think those are great points. And, and I, I think we're going to get to this later, but that's why it's so important to write polls more objectively. And I know we're going to talk about it later. If you're going to get good results, you got to write them in a sort of detached way about yourself and your, and your cause and your candidate. So we'll, I know we'll talk more about that, but those, a lot of those things get addressed if you do it right. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It, I think the number one thing a lot of people do um, is they write their own biases into, into polls. And I think that just, it hurts everyone. They will get into it a little bit more. Uh, but the second part of basics is methodology. So you might hear this word thrown around. We want to make sure that everyone understands the different methodologies, what it means, and so on and so forth. So methodology is just a fancy way of saying, how is this poll going to be conducted? The first and most popular one is a phone poll or a live poll. So it's a live person talking to another live person. Uh, the cost of this, this is usually the most expensive, depending on what kind of poll you're doing. I mean, just from $5,000 to $50,000. Um, when you think about the $50,000 range, that's when you're really testing someone's um, messaging, you're testing their bio, they're testing a number of things, you're testing negatives on yourself, negatives on your opponent, seeing what would work. Those polls can get very expensive, especially if you want to get, you know, a thousand responses, 1500 responses, it gets really expensive. Um, out of the three most popular polls, phone is by far the most expensive. As you can see here, it ranges really high. Um, so the pros on, on doing a full poll, it's typically the, the most reliable one. Um, it, you get, it's, it's trusted, it, the, the room for margin of error is a little smaller than other ones. Um, the other thing I like about phone polls is targeted. So when I say targeted, you know, if I'm calling for Jonathan, I can ensure that, you know, Jonathan's the one answering the phone, he's the one answering the survey and so on and so forth. It, it, it's as targeted as you could possibly get when you do a poll. Uh, the cons, it's really expensive. Um, it's, it, it's expensive. The other major con is it's time consuming. So, you know, especially if you're running polls in a heavy election year like we are right now, um, we, you might be bumped because there's so many polls going out for every ballot measure, every candidate, every race. So that might be difficult. Um, and so you might be waiting weeks before you get response back. So that's, that's one of the negatives about phone polling. And just to help people understand why it's expensive, if you just think very logically, it's because you're paying for people's time to make the calls. So that's, that is expensive. So every question you add adds a few more minutes that they have to make phone calls, that they have to work. So, so you know, the longer your survey is with the questions and the, the length of the questions, uh, the more expensive it's going to get. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm long winded in person and in my questioning. So I've, uh, I've had to learn how to cut down my question to make them succinct because also the very real fact that people get tired of answering questions, you just hang up and you just wasted, you know, 10, 20 minutes of someone's life and you have to start all over. Um, so the second one that's really popular is what's called IVR, referred to as IVR, interactive voice response. This is usually like a touch tone poll, like press one if you're a Democrat, press two if you're a Republican kind of calls. The cost range somewhere between $1,000 to $10,000. It's, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the pros, it could be targeted. So I put the could be because, you know, I can call Jonathan's household, but I can't guarantee that he's the one answering. It might be his, his spouse. It might be a child. It might be an in-law. You, you really don't have any control. So you're calling the household. That still might be a targeted method, uh, depending on if it's like a good household to target. Uh, the other thing is the quick turnaround. This, these happen really quick. You can get a response within like, you know, two days, maybe even less, just depending on how many people you target. The cons, it, it doesn't really debug provide in-depth information, right? So we talked about phone polling that can give you possible messaging, possible negatives and how effective they are. This is a very binary choice. So you, you give people an A choice or a B choice and they have to pick. So you're not gonna get really good in-depth information, but it is a really good 
pulse check. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of IVRs, especially when you think about some of these lower ticket races, like municipal elections, school boards, even some state legislators that aren't like really heavily contested. My logic here is like, I've been seeing them become more and more accurate with the end result. And then part of me thinks that it's because how quick of a decision you have to make around an IVR because you feel pressured as someone taking it. Um, I think that's like the amount of time someone gives to a state legislative race or a municipal race that they really don't care about, that they're not heavily invested in. And I think you really do get a good gut check on where people are at. Um, what are your thoughts on IVRs? I've been seeing the effectiveness go up too. So I'm, I'm more open to them now, in particular in those lower ballot races where you're not spending as much money in the race as an organization. You may not be spending as much to support candidates. And, you know, because if you do a, and messaging polls are really important if, you know, the live calls where you can ask a lot of messaging questions are really important for those big races you're going to get involved in. But if you need a quick look and have some just basic, basic things you're trying to understand, uh, you can't, you know, can't go wrong, I think, doing these. Obviously, you know, we still want to check with your pollster and find, make sure you have a quality pollster, which we'll talk about later. But uh, I'm, I'm really warming up to them for, for that for that niche, those, those shorter, those, those smaller races that don't need quite as much um, uh, of a thorough vetting. Yeah, I also think there's some like, it's a kind of like the privacy you get in the, in the voting booth where like you don't have to admit who you're voting for, right? Like I think in the live phone call, you might be skewed about like your perception of how you want that person to perceive you, but an IVR is just like touchstone and it's really easy and kind of guilt-free. Um, I think that might be one of the reasons why like they, they might be getting better and better at accuracy. Uh, the third methodology people use is online polling. So this again, the, the cost is so much to IVR. It actually could get a little more expensive. I put one to 10. I have seen them go up to like 15, 18, 20, um, but that just depends on how many responses you want. Also, uh, you know, if you're trying to poll in a, in a district that like is either rural or just doesn't have that many vote, like that many emails or um, IP numbers, like it get more expensive. Uh, so the pros of, of online polling, quick turnaround, volume, uh, especially if you're doing like a statewide, you can get that really quick, really easy. It's really ex inexpensive for the number of responses you can get. The cons here, I put targeting. And so some some are getting much, much better at targeting. I, I haven't done online polling in about two years now. No, like a year and a half now. And last time I did it, one of the main things I didn't like is that uh, the methodology of, of online polling kind of allows for a self-selecting group. So they would put on banner ads of like, click here to tell us what you think about, you know, Donald Trump or whatever. And it was just like a clickbait to get people to take an online poll about like state legislative stuff. Um, and I just really feel that a lot of online polling, and they're different, right? This is talked about different culture, but um, I think one aspect of, of this is like, it's a self-selecting group who want to tell you what they think, who want to participate in polling and ad. And I think that's going to be detrimental to your poll because you're having a self-select group answer these questions and it's not going to give you an honest shot of what the public is at. Um, and then the margin error is usually higher um, and, and we've seen it get better and better, but it's still rather high compared to the other two. Any thoughts on it, Jonathan? No, I think you've hit the right points. Yeah. And so now we're going to talk about different types of, of polls that we have. So the first one we talked about a little bit, they're usually referred to benchmark polls. Uh, you know, it commonly refers to benchmark polls or messaging polls or public opinion polls. These are the ones that we talked about that range in like the $50,000 range. Um, they're really robust. Um, they give you insight on messaging, they give you insight of state of the race or state of the state, um, and they give you a possible pathway to victory. If there is one, it can also tell you that there's not a pathway to victory. Uh, so these polls are really important. The sample size really does range. I put 400 to 2000. This is assuming that you're working in the metropolitan area, state ledge race, municipal race, that, that could be as low as like maybe 250 to 500 would probably get a response. Um, the bigger the race, the bigger the city, you're gonna, want to get somewhere between you know 500 to a thousand i've seen some people go up to 2000 again the cost is there we talked about the cost of times and then the timeline for benchmark polls is usually several months before election day so this is usually done somewhere in the summer um because when you think about election season while it seems long most of the money spent in the last you know 
six to nine weeks of an election. Um, so this polls are usually done, you know, July, August gives you enough time to like really think about strategically making decisions about what you're going to get involved. Um, but the same is true for uh, primaries, right? Like this would be several months before our primary, you're getting involved in a primary. Yeah, no, that's great. I think benchmark polls are really interesting if you do them well. And we'll talk more about that again as we go through this presentation. But just asking the right questions gives you a really interesting view into where the race could go. But yeah, they are really costly. So just make sure you give yourself lots of time. Like don't rush these things, you know, plan, plan lots of time to do it right. Because you're if you're putting down, you know, like again, the range varies if you're doing a statewide poll or a legislative poll, as Christian noted. But Either way, it's a really big investment, and you don't want to just just jump into it without really being thoughtful about the questions. The second kind of common poll is tracking poll. Um, sometimes this is considered called a horse race poll. Um, this is kind of like when you think of an IVR, where it gives you a quick response. Tracking polls kind of give you that. They give you a pulse check of, you know, where's my candidate's name ID or my ballot measure um, name ID? Do people know about it? Uh, you know, how popular is it or not popular is it, and how popular is the, the opponent. Um, it, again, these are really short, simple surveys. These are typically done after money has been spent. And so you can track whether or not, you know, whether your mail piece, whether your digital ads or your field program is having an impact uh, and to what degree. Um, the, the ranges between this is, I'd say 300 to 1,000, but you know, honestly, I've seen it go as low as like 200 responses. Um, a thousand is on the higher end, again, depending on the state of the race you're working in. And these can be a lot less expensive. Some people use tracking polls to, you know, if this is a second or third tracking poll you're doing and you're figuring out that you're not having an impact. Uh, this is where the survey becomes a little more complicated. So you might not just ask, you know, who are you voting for, Christian and Jonathan? You might ask, okay, if you know that Jonathan was a high school principal and award-winning high school principal, would you be more or less likely to vote for him? You might add those additional questions to figure out your strategy. And these are the perfect ones uh, to, to add those questions. And that's also what gets it a little bit more expensive. Yeah, and when I look at a tracking poll, a lot of times think about what has happened. Like you wanna make, you know, think about what's happened in the meantime so you can evaluate uh, what, what maybe caused the shifts in the tracking poll. Cause sometimes the tracking poll uh, because you have to, you have a more limited number of questions. Uh, you're not you're necessarily going to be able to dig into everything, but you, you can make some educated guesses about what has changed in the last three weeks or something like that. That 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 caused the shift. Like what type of advertising has been happening? What types of issues have arisen? And you can quickly evaluate what maybe you need to change or what's going well. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It's like, you can't account for everything that's been going on. But I think in order for you to be the best at your job, especially if you're conducting these tracking polls, is um, you have to track what's going on in order to conduct a proper tracking poll, I think. Uh, because you're going to need to have answers and be able to pivot, especially if you're, you're spending a lot of money on these elections or any kind of money, quite frankly. Um, you want to be able to have a response on why is it that my numbers went down or why is it that they went up and, and how can you continue to see them increase? So that requires a lot of like note taking and, and assumptions basically on, on what's going on in the environment. Uh, all right, so now we're gonna get into how to write a poll. And, and this, is, um, this, is a, this is really meant for you to be a good steward of, you know, if you have the skill sets already, how to get better at them, or if you're gonna trust your pollster, like what are some safe, safeguards you can put in place to make sure that they're doing the best of their ability because you know like everything else there's good pollsters there's mediocre pollsters and there's bad pollsters um but there's also pollsters who are good but they're just busy um and, and it's your job to like and you know push and advocate for your poll your poll to be the best to make sure you're getting the response so these are a few things that john and i thought would be really good to think about as you're conducting a poll so the first is begin with a focus group especially if you're doing something like a statewide ballot measure or you know any kind of ballot measure or if you're doing like the messaging uh for a candidate which means you're getting in really early and you're you're really navigating a lot of this uh race the best way to do this is start with a focus group um 
they're expensive. <laughs> so as most things in politics are, uh, they, they can be expensive, but I would say start with that. Now I won't get in too much into like what the focus group should look like or how long it takes, but begin with the focus group. Uh, I just, why I would start with this because a lot of times the focus groups will, will, instead of you having to come up with what you want to test, what messages you want to test, the focus group sort of teases out, teases out what those things are that you want to ask the broader public about. Yeah. So don't try right. to be the smart guy or smart woman about, you know, the, the poll, defer to the people who are in the community to, to help you understand what, how you need to articulate what you're doing. And honestly, uh, every focus group I've ever conducted, there's always like a diamond in that rough that someone just phrases something just so perfectly or encapsulates a sentiment just the best way. And it makes its way into a poll. And, and you'll see that that response is the one that people really resonate with. Cause I think you're right. Like while there's, we're all incredibly smart people and intelligent, sometimes we get too in the weeds or sometimes we just, you know, talk in our own, own language that it doesn't really resonate with the public. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I think it's just so vital to get folks through. Uh, as you're conducting these polls, you're thinking about why am I writing a poll? Ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish? The, the biggest mistake I see people do is they try to squeeze they try to Frankenstein this. They, they want to ask about, you know, they're an organization that really wants to get more funding into, into education. So they'll ask questions about like different techniques and different tax ways to get more money. They'll simultaneously ask about all the candidates that are running, but they also want to get the sentiment about, you know, some new radical policy. And when you do that, you really, you know, you're going an inch deep and in, in six feet wide. And it doesn't do you any good because um, usually when you don't go deep enough, you won't find the right messaging guide uh, to get to you the pathway to victory. Um, so figure out what you're trying to accomplish on this poll. It usually should be singular or, or like maybe two goals um, to really be able to make the most out of a poll. Um, third one is something that like I have seen so many people be guilty of my, myself included is like, don't ask a question whose answer you're not intending to use. And like it, this is so vital. You know, um, if, I see this a lot, you know, born out of frustration with, with their opposition and say, well, you know, I know that they, they, this policy is wrong for the community and I want to call them out on it. And so they'll pull it and the one, they'll pull it in a way that like gives them the answer they want to hear. And two, even if they get the answer, they'll never run a negative ad or anything of that nature. So, you know, as Jonathan said, these get really expensive. The more questions you ask, you really have to ask yourself, is this five minutes that I'm asking a question, am I ever going to use it? And the answer is no, then you should really take it out no matter how intriguing or mentally stimulating the, the response might be. Yeah, I, I have run into this a lot. And a lot of times when I write a poll, the first draft has those kind of questions in it. And I often, so I, so I just say, so what if they say yes? What does that do to change my strategy? Why do I care? And there's a reason for asking slam dunk questions at times if you're going to publicly release a poll just to make sure, you know, you've set the ground to let people know, hey, this is, people do support this. You know, it might be obvious to everybody, but we're just reiterating it. So there's a reason, but that's, again, you t asking yourself the question, am I going to use this? And uh, a lot of times I think it, it might seem interesting, but it's not going to change your strategy based on how people answer. So yeah, yeah I'm all, all with Christian on that one. Sure. Yeah, I, and I want to echo your like slam dunk response. I, I see that more as like an advocacy, right? Like, again, you don't want this poll to do too much. Um, but, you know, if this is really important and you think it's a slam dunk answer, then sure, release that portion of the poll, make it public and leave the rest. But yeah, I think, I think that falls into advocacy. The other thing is test your own negative. Look, if, you're, if you know there's a stigma against you, uh, against your organization, against your candidate, you know, whether it's because of party affiliation, you know, whatever negative is you have to test it, especially if you know it's gonna come. Um, you'd be foolish not to test your own negatives, especially if you know what they're gonna be. Um, because this is also gonna tell you whether or not to get in this race to begin with. Because you know, we find out that Jonathan might be an award-winning principal, but he also got arrested for, you know, embezzling. That might sink him shit. <laughs> uh, so you gotta really test those negatives, especially if you know what they are. Um, and if you know they're coming. So don't be afraid. Add, because campaigns don't happen in a vacuum. Your issues don't happen in a vacuum. They happen with the point counterpoint. So you have to take that into account when you do a poll. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other one is like, we talked about this in all the other ones, but 
be really conscious of your biases, right? Like a lot of pollsters will, you know, tell you not to do something or they just, it's a cookie cutter process and they allow for negative framing. So it gives you the answer you want to hear. Unless you're doing an advocacy poll, like that does not help you figure out a pathway to victory. It, it just will give you the wrong issues. You'll invest in the wrong things and you'll end up losing at the end of the day. And so common questions you should ask when you're talking to a vendor, there's a few. So the first is like, who will they be polling? This is something that's near and dear to my heart. Like I know most of us aren't data scientists, myself included. I really do believe that we should, you know, especially you have access to data and you have access to likely voters and you know who you're going to be sending mail to, you know, who's going to vote. Um, there's no reason those aren't the people you should be polling. And one thing that I, one problem I have with pollster is that, if you go to a pollster, they usually have like their own little Rolodex of people they know they can generate responses from, and they might have a good voter score, they might not. Um, I'm really interested in making sure that they're willing to take the data that I give them, the voter list that I gave them, or just they'll give me theirs so I can test it against, you know, who is in my universe, who is in. So, you know, I, you know, at the end of the day, you have to trust your pollster, but I, I think the more transparent they are about their data and who they're polling, the better I am to, to work with them, quite frankly. Yeah, and this is and this is something that you know it depends a little on your level of expertise, you know, for your ability to, like Christian said, give them your data versus not. But um, don't don't hesitate to ask them about how they created their sample and of people they're asking. You know, why did they predict that twenty percent of the voters are Democratic and thirty are Republican? You know, as they as they decide who they're going to poll. Uh, don't hesitate to ask some questions, and uh, yeah, you got to look at their track record, ask references, but um, uh, that's going to be, this is pretty important. Yeah. The other one, we talked about the methodology. You, you can like whatever you like, but you should ask them what their methodology and why they use that. Some people are really strong proponents of like online, um, and they have really good logical reasons, and they have a track record with it, um, some phones. The other one, the sample size, again, the more responses you get, the more you the more accurate the, the the more accurate the poll is going to be, and the less margin for error there'll be. Um, and then the other one is at the end, will they write a memo? So some pollsters would just give you the hard data, like you know, twenty percent Jonathan, twenty percent Christian, rest undecided, and they just leave it at that. Um, but other ones write really nuanced memos about here's opportunities for you to lean into, here's opportunities you want to stay away from. Um, and it just depends on the poll and depends on the pollster, but I, I always find those really valuable because they're really good, like anchoring your thought as you make your strategy move forward. Yep, I agree. All right, so we're gonna get into the nitty gritty now. So how to read a poll. So you'll hear us talk about this top lines and cross tabs. So top lines, just a quick analysis is like, what's the cumulative result of this poll? What, do, what are the main takeaways? When you think of cross tabs, this is looking at specific demographics within the people who are polled. Um, and that demographic could be age, it could be party affiliation, it could be a number of things, but looking at a very specific uh, uh, demographic within a poll. Um, pay attention to lean and strong. So for those who haven't conducted a poll, polls are usually done in a, a scale. So they'll be, how likely are you to vote for Jonathan? Strongly support Jonathan, lean Jonathan, undecided, you know, lean against him, strongly against him. So it's on a scale. And what you'll find is that, especially early on, you might get some leans and as the election goes on, hopefully they, they go over to strong support. Uh, but you really have to pay attention to them because it tells you how much information they're getting or, you know, retaining as, as your candidate goes on. On this side. Yeah, no, yeah. Really, I would say it is particularly important for messaging questions and leaning and lean and strong so you say hey all the voters want lower taxes but they're kind of lukewarm about it but they all really want their roads to be fixed so you have to i think be critical just because some people say they like something doesn't mean they care a lot about it so you need to pay close attention to that yeah i i love that differential um yeah undecided so this is where the leans and strongs really pay attention it's like you'll like we said especially early on you'll see 50 percent 40 percent undecided uh, this is where you look at the cross tab. So if you see someone's undecided, you can go back and see what they actually, what excites them, what doesn't excite them, what their turn offs are. Um, and that really helps you find a, a, a pathway forward. The other thing that I think is usually lost on this, um, and I think it's just like out of sheer rush, is the order of the questions. 
you know, I've taken countless of polls and I figured, you know, I answered the question one way and they asked me the same question in a different method. I'm anchoring myself in that first answer. Like it, I'm not changing and it might not give you the real response. So really think about, you know, I've seen so many polls ask me, do you care about traffic? And I'll be, no, don't care about traffic. And then I'll get 30 questions about traffic. And it's like, well, you're not really giving me uh, a room here to give you a real nuanced answer because you're forcing me into giving you a response. So I, I think it, it really does like hamper uh, people's response and biases on it. And, and the last thing about like how to read a poll and how to write a poll when you think about like a, a pollster is like, I, I talk about the sizzle on the science. So, you know, when you think about a pollster, they have to be kind of a salesperson because they are selling the public, this candidate, the best possible narrative that will get them excited to go and vote for this candidate. Uh, but you also want the scientific, like non biasy there because you can, you can sell yourself into giving the public a false alternative um, that won't actually result in the win in November. So it's really important to like, as you're looking at this and reading it, did you overcompensate and, and give people a false choice? Uh, and give them, you know, a, a terrible choice framing in this one and an, an amazing choice on this one. So you got to be really careful when you're reading these polls and making sure that you're, you're grounding yourself in as much science as possible. All right, so this is the exciting part. We're going to look at some polls and we're going to ask you folks, you know, some, some basic questions here. So the first example here we have is, uh, it's a candidate race. So, um, You'll see here that candidate one has about a 12%, uh, 11% positive rating. Candidate two has about a 10% positive rating and candidate three has about an 8% positive rating. And they're all pretty equal on when it comes to neutral and they're all pretty the same when it comes to somewhat negative. Now, so this, just for more context, this was conducted five weeks, uh, I'm sorry, four weeks before election day Every single one of these candidates had sent out mail, multiple pieces of the mail, have sent out canvassers. Um, and we're seeing that most people, you know, about 20% of the public still don't know these candidates' names. A lot of people are undecided. Um, and so I wanna show you the second piece of polling here. So you see that candidate one, if the race was held today, you, you'd get, you know, about 8%. Candidate two, you get about 8%. And candidate three, you get about 6%. So looking at those numbers, you know, Jonathan, we're still four weeks away from election day. What, is, what does this tell you? Uh, I would say that the candidates, their messaging and the way they're contacting voters hasn't been very effective. And if I was supporting one of those candidates, I would be particularly, I'd be particularly concerned about um, kind of where, where they're headed. Uh, even though it shows the numbers are all about the same, um, I, you know, I'd be worried that my opponent's going to find the, the key to break out of that, and I'm not going to. So I'm, I'm re-examining what we're doing. Yeah, I, I think that's so vital, right? Like, there, this is really nerve-wracking. If you're four weeks away from Election Day, you've spent several weeks already trying to raise name ID or raise positives, and you're still, you're barely breaking out in double digits, and your opponents are right lockstep with you. Um, that, to me, says that, the spending is probably equal. People aren't paying attention to this race. And to your point, like whatever it is you've been doing hasn't, hasn't resonated for one reason or another and, and to really think about it. Um, I, none of this tells me, you know, go invest more. And none of this tells me pull out of this race. It, it, so I wish there was like a magic number there that would tell you, you know what, pull, pull the string and, and get out of there. You just let them, let them for themselves. But this is, and this, the reason I use this example is like, this is what we're seeing more and more of. The undecideds keep going higher and higher uh, around municipal races. Um, and so it, it's something, something to keep a look at. Uh. So the, the third example I want to, I mean, the second example I want to do is this one. And so uh, let's just pretend we're a campaign that is trying to expand pre-K throughout the state. And we did a poll uh, and this is the poll that came back. So the question was, which of the following is the most important reason to expand pre-K? And you see here that the, the overwhelming responses that we get uh, are, it provides critical development 
Uh, it's crucial during the main development years that gets up somewhere between 41 and 49 percent. The second most likely reason people want pre-K is because it, uh, it prepares children for the transition to school. And the third choice, it provides affordable child care. So these are the main three. So right. So we know that people, people who support pre-K, the main reason they want it is it's critical for the development years. It gets them ready for real school, the K through 12 system. Um, and it also provides affordable health care. And so the next one, the next question we have, oh, did I miss it? Okay, so, so knowing this, Jonathan, you're running this pre-K statewide ballot initiative. Uh, what talking points are you gonna be using with, with voters? Well, I mean, it's, this one's pretty strong. And I think a lot of times, uh, you know, you maybe you wanna talk about something else. Maybe you wanna talk about college or you wanna talk about uh, other points, but this one provides a pretty clear answer that um, it's about your general messaging, what it should be about uh, with the development years. I do think approach, but uh, obviously the, the major message is really around that development. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, right? Like, the, the public has overwhelmingly just sold you that they think this is critical because of the, the, the age range that kids are going to pre-K. It's development wise. Um, yeah, and I think this is, this also goes to show to your point, like maybe I'm an organization that wants pre-K because I'm, I'm, my organization focuses on college readiness. And we know that kids who go to pre-K are more college ready. Um, this would tell me, leave my issue at the door and really run, run towards, uh, you know, maybe even, transition to K uh, to, to school is, is the best messaging. So um, this is this is how you would make sure that you're, you're reading the poll right and, and tackling the issues that voters want to care about. And, and there's some cynicism about that, right? With is like, hey, you know, you're just doing what the voters say, but you know, that's a, you're not, you're not, you're not sacrificing your cause. You're, you obviously support pre-K. You just want to understand how other people connect to it. And it's really important. So just because it the general public might have a different take than you it's not like you're selling out by by talking about it differently you're you're achieving your goal you yeah just, i i think that's so important right like i think there's people who are all or nothing and politics is never all or nothing like it is a long long road and and look if i'm an organization that only cares about college readiness for example um what this tells me is that on the high end 15 percent of people get the connection between pre-k and college on the low end, 6% of the get, get get that connection. So what it tells me as an organization is like, okay, first things first, I wanna get pre-K passed. But the second thing is, and this is like what I have to do during non-election cycles uh, season is I gotta make that connection to voters because I would want this number to reflect, you know, at the very minimum, the 20 to 30%, but hopefully like in the years coming, I can make that connection even higher. So it, it also gives you a reflection on where your organization messaging is. All right, so this is, a, this is the more complicated poll, which I, I think is gonna be interesting here. All right, so uh, we asked people, and so just give everyone a little bit of context. This, this is an actual poll. We polled people in these four states that you see here. Uh, and the people we polled were primary, Democratic primary voters. Um, so just for a little context. So imagine we're running a race uh, in the Democratic primary in these states. So which of the following things is the most, which of the following do you think is the most important American value? And you'll see here that it's somewhere like, it's, it's equality, opportunity in that order, and then freedom. So the top three are equality, opportunity, and freedom. Um, so then let's look at the other questions here. So, there we go. Which, which value do you think pertains to public schools um, you'll see that opportunity just runs away with it. Um, and then equality comes in second. So we, we see almost a flip, uh, but really le leaning into opportunity. So, so Jonathan, if you're running a pro public school, you know, messaging campaign to democratic voters, you know, what value would you tie it back to? Yeah, you, you ask, throw me softballs here, Christian, but you know, that opportunity one, and, and I, I like to read these things a little different, like what, what does opportunity mean? And I also think about it, it just shows that I think folks are more focused on opportunity for their kids 
And so they're more individually focused, which is okay. That's their job as parents to advocate for their kids and their grandkids. Uh, but, you know, I think when I, when I look at talking about education, I, I know that every person's looking at through their own individual prism, like what kind of opportunities is it giving my, my children? Um, as opposed to being a little less concerned about equality. I mean, they want that, but that's not their first priority. Their first, first priority is their own and the opportunity that they give. And I could be reading too much into it, but I think you do have to look at these critically uh, and dig a little deeper. Like what, what, what are people thinking when they use these words? Yeah, no, I think that uh, while that was, yeah, I agree. That was a softball about opportunity. I think what you hit the nail on the head though is, uh, is like, you might not have, I don't think you would have expected this. You know, if I'm telling you, um, what's the value Democrat, Democratic primary voters hold true? I don't know if it would have been opportunity, right? Like I think maybe diversity would have been at the head of it, maybe equality. Um, and, and I think that's also important to know, right? Like if you're talking to someone as like, I think the one way to message this is like, if we want to say you're a good American, and then if you want to talk about American values, they're, they're telling you they, they care about equality and opportunity, not so much diversity, but when it comes to schools, they care a little bit more about diversity. They care a bit about equity. So it's interesting, like if you're talking about American values as a whole, you might not be talking about diversity. Um, uh, you, you might be talking about freedom. And uh, so freedom was the, the second place or third place here. Um, but when you're talking about schools to these people, um, they all they want to hear is about opportunity and equality and a little bit of diversity. So I, I think that's a interesting especially when we look at the cross tabs and then so make it a little bit more complicated it, uh, i want i want to look at this poll so these three questions are all asked about uh college so i'll read them out um so the first question is if a child is not prepared to attend college who do you think is to blame and you'll see that about somewhere between 25 percent of the people say parents are to blame about 20 percent say the school system's to blame and about you know, in the 15 to 18 range, it says that uh, the child's to blame. So, you know, about 70% of the people put the blame on either the parent, the child, or the school system. So that, that's the first question. The second question is, you know, do you believe that the school system in the U.S. is fair and equal to all children of race and social backgrounds? And overwhelmingly, you know, by 50 to 70 point overwhelmingly majority say it's not fair. So Democrats across the country say that the school system's not fair. And then the third question we ask them is, you know, should, should public schools involve social justice and discrimination? Like how important is it for us to talk about that in public schools? And what you'll see is that it's almost 90% of people think that in public schools, we need to talk about discrimination and social justice. But if you look at this backwards, the way I look at this is, okay, so about 90% of people tell me that they believe that there's discrimination going on and we need to talk about the importance of it and importance of social justice. About 80% tell me that the school system isn't fair to everyone, regardless of income and, and race. But when you ask them who's to blame, you know, about 50% of the blame is squarely on the individual, whether it's the parent or the child. And I just think that's so fascinating because, you know, you're telling me it, it, the system's rigged, that it's not fair to everyone, that we need to do something about it, but yet we're putting this, the blames largely on parents and children. So I think this is like an interesting dynamic as, as you know, in this organization, if you're talking about education, how do you target, how do you, how do you change the messaging around this or do you change it? Yeah, pretty, pretty fascinating. And it's just another reason why you need to read all the questions and, and think about what really digs into what they re what they really believe when you write questions, you know? So that, that first one to me is that's the raw answer. The others are the ones they feel like they have to say. That's such an interesting point, right? Like, so um, I, I think you're right. I think you're right because like, I've never seen a poll where like 90% of the people <laughs> agree on, on something. And, and so, you know, how would you test this moving forward to see like how important is it to them or, or what do they mean that social justice and discrimination is going to be an important topic? What, you know, what questions would you ask or how would you lean into that more to figure out if it's something that would move the needle or not? And, and so Jonathan, now that, now that you've seen that like people gut check, blame parents, school system and children, and they also put the, the value of opportunity uh, when they think about public education, like what, what are some of the narratives that you would try to tackle to make sure that 
people, your, your ballot measure to fund schools more would pass. What would I do for my ballot measure? Uh, well, I would definitely focus on the individual more and their personal opportunity. And I would um, probably, um, I would definitely use words like, you know, if I was talking to Democratic voters, like social justice and equity, but I would focus primarily on what the opportunity is for them and not, not the, not the system itself. I would just, so I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I have to think a little more about it, but, um, yeah, I definitely, would, I would definitely lean in more on the individual messaging and not, not kind of relying on others. Yeah. Which, which is really like, again, this, these are democratic primary voters, right? Like you wouldn't think that their mentality is overwhelmed, like pull yourself up by the bootstraps, but that's kind of the reaction they're giving you here. They're giving you that what they value is opportunity and, you know, parents and children are the ones who kind of own this to some degree. Um, so I think you're right. I think when you're message, when you're framing the messaging, it has to be all about opportunity um, and the opportunity for the individual, either child or then the opportunity for the family um, and the, how that ties back to, you know, our, our other American values. So uh, I'll, that's just a, a few examples. I see we have a few things in the chat. I've been tracking it, but uh, uh, any thoughts or questions here? Um, you know, I don't really have anything. I think you covered things really well and I'm excited to, um, excited to kind of go over the next phase here with folks and, and, uh, you know, obviously these things will be available on YouTube and all that, but, uh, excited to continue the, the, the future topics that we're going to dig into and, and help people with polling. If they have questions, you know, always contact me or Christian. I'm happy to talk through these things with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone. I appreciate it. And, uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you.